Hello, welcome to the New School Admitted Student um, uh, welcome and a chat uh, for um, the College of Performing Arts. So we're here with uh, the deans of the College of Performing Arts, the Dean of Manus School of Music, the School of Jazz, and the School of Drama, and I'm going to introduce them to you right now. Um, we have Martin Mueller here, who is the Dean of School of Jazz, and uh, Richard Kessler, who is the Executive Dean of the College of Performing Arts and also Manus School of Music, and Pippin Parker, um, the Dean of the School of Drama. So we're going to do this to help you answer your questions. Um, we know that a lot of our admitted students are all over the world. We have a very high international <laughs> population, or even just busy performing artists um, finishing up their um, undergraduate or their high school um, requirements. So we wanted to give you a chance to answer some questions, to find out more about the school, to enjoy a wonderful concert of our uh, percussion ensemble, and to learn a little bit more about what we have planned for next year, for the rest of this year, and um, also some really exciting things that we have planned for next year. So I'm going to ask um, a couple of the deans right now to talk a little bit about the program. So Richard, can you start to talk about what you have planned for the College of Performing Arts and also for Manus? Sure. Thank you, Georgia. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thanks for signing in. We're really eager to speak with you. We're really eager to have you join the New School community. This is um, going to be a great year next year. We have a lot of different things going on, and a lot of it's really formed by the ways in which these three schools, which were once separate, the School of Drama, the School of Jazz, and Manus School, they were separate schools for many, many years, but now that we're part of the College for Performing Arts, we're doing more and more productions together. We have classes that we've created that span the three schools. So we're working on all kinds of programs. We have a music theater piece that we're planning for next year. We have an experimental opera, Dust by Robert Ashley, that we're going to be doing. We have more and more courses opening up that involve students from drama, jazz, and manis all working together. And more and more high-level productions are happening in rented spaces, not only spaces within the university, but places like Carnegie Hall, Alice Tully Hall, and performances all throughout the world. You'll hear a little bit more about that from my colleague Martin. We'll speak about some of the festivals and high-level opportunities that the School of Jazz affords its students, and likewise the School of Drama. But it's going to be a really, really exciting year for everyone, no matter what your course of study is. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit about the School of Jazz, Martin? <laughs> well, thank you. And my own welcome to everybody. It's uh, great to have this uh, stream to connect with you wherever you are in the world. Um, there's a, a metaphor I like to use for the School of Jazz, which now I think applies ably to the, the whole College of Performing Arts, and it's zero degrees of separation. When you combine New York City, when you combine the new schools, very progressive uh, means of educating and engagement in the world, you get new creative art. And all three of us together are now uh, working to uh, encourage our students and our communities to take full advantage of that. In the jazz school, we've uh, really grown from a very organic beginning when jazz wasn't as much in the academy. And we've reconciled that in this artist practitioner model um, by, uh, by bringing the best uh, minds of both the legacy generations and also newer, more progressive uh, faculty. And each new generation that comes in takes their own tone from who they are in time and place as artists. So this is always a moving target in terms of the jazz school and all of our ambitions for our students, that they are going to realize who they are in their own time and place and incorporate the relevancies and the meanings towards their own successes. So it's, we have an open canon, we have an open spirit of participation and learning that we guide with all the rigor that we have built into our curriculums, and then we let our students take the way, especially in jazz up to this point, and maybe the other schools are going to be this way in the future too. It's all about self-navigation and self-determination of choosing your own electives, of choosing who you will study with in your private lessons after a foundation uh, experience, of putting your own person personnel together from in your ensembles, and taking the advantage of this entire wonderful city and the world that we have uh, connections and experiences in. Great. Um, Pippin, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, school of drama and the programs that you have? Sure. 
Uh, well, we have a lot coming up this year uh, that we can talk about in a little bit. Um, but first of all, I'd also like to thank you for joining us and to welcome you. Um, you know, for us, one thing um, being now joined with these two music divisions that I want to say is that it is incredibly inspiring to uh, be able to witness as an audience member and a colleague um, the uh, fantastic talent of the Jazz and Mana students. It's just off the charts. It's unbelievable. These um, students are wonderful. They're engaged. And to hear them is just kind of mind-blowingly amazing. Um, and at Drama, um, we are happy to be in a part of this community which really celebrates the making of art in all of its, uh, uh, performing arts in all of its different ways. Um, one thing about about art and the performing arts is that it is really a, um, a human activity. It's a human endeavor. So in addition to your uh, spectacular talent as writers and actors and directors, creative technologists that we are um, excited to have join us, um, we're also excited to, um, to meet and to bring in the, the people who you are uh, in addition to being artists, the whole human beings, which we talk about a lot. Um, and that is um, something that I think makes this community uh, here at the New School uh, very different. We are highly engaged in collaboration. We celebrate ensemble work. We have tremendous respect for, um, for all artists and all the people who support artists. Um, and we are engaged and are trying to make, uh, make really fine art uh, with um, uh, in a process of rigorous creativity, but also uh, hoping that that art has meaning and significance in a larger kind of world. And uh, I know that we share that with our, our brothers and sisters uh, at Manus and Jazz. So we are um, excited about these opportunities and have, in fact, started leveraging these opportunities in uh, really remarkable ways and ways which I think are providing an insight uh, and a sort of pathway to what the professional landscape is uh, rapidly becoming, which is um, in many ways a big unknown. Uh, and in many ways, um, our students are uniquely poised to take advantage of and um, prove themselves as real uh, leaders, artistic leaders, uh, and leaders in the community. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a couple questions about, but I want to answer Jacqueline's question, which is how many students are in the BFA Dramatic Arts program now? And each class is about 54 students. Um, we are just bringing in our fourth class this year. So this fall will be a, our fourth class, and we'll have seniors for the first time. So just to answer Jacqueline's questions, and if there's any other questions that you can send them in to, um, we'll, we'll try and answer them. Right. But follow it. Yeah. That we're very um, glad. We actually, it is 54 students. It's actually three ensembles of 18 students, um, which is not doesn't define the totality of your experience, but some of the foundational uh, courses are in are, are in ensembles. Those ensembles are rearranged after the first year, um, and um, so there's going to be about 200. Uh, more or less uh, undergraduates, and as we reach what we call steady state this year, yeah. like four years of um, of undergrad students, we are also um, finally finishing our complete rollout of productions and opportunities for students, electives, all the things which kind of make up um, the constellation of our multidisciplinary um, uh, undergrad program. So we're really excited. We feel like we have this is the year that we've sort of arrived and are reaching our kind of. Uh, maturity, uh, <laughs> if, if one can reach that in four years, we feel uh, it's a significant year for us. The question I have now for is for each one of you, if you could explain or talk a little bit about what you think um, could make a student at your schools really successful. What are the things that they can do um, through their four years or however long their program is that can, where they can get the most out of it? And um, what does that look like? Um, and if you could just talk a little bit about that. Well, um, we talk a lot about um, you know, shared uh, creative capacity. And uh, a, a lot of the values that come out of a jazz culture lend itself beautifully when you talk about uh, embrace of risk and improvisation and collaboration. Um, these are all built into the DNA of, of being a, a jazz artist or any practicing artist. Um, so it starts with that because you know the kind of student that comes to us 
is the kind of student that you know is is self-directed and has those kind of uh, aptitudes to empower themselves in the, in their own destiny. Uh, again, among all these rich uh, uh, offerings and choices, but to me, the, the success comes from looking in and looking up. In other words, looking in, in through the entire trajectory which we encourage and guide to, um, uh, as a reflective practice, to uh, really think about um, who you are as an artist, as an artist's identity, to, to then use the resources that you have and the choices that you make to inform that and to reiteratively inform it every, every semester, every day. And, and, and looking out means looking out at the world and understanding the changes of the world and, and then how to navigate that and how to prepare yourself uh, within the portfolio life with all the skills that we will help, uh, that we will help provide here. But uh, the success comes from the individual. Mm -hmm. We're just a support team to make that happen. Uh, and the success comes from the experience of the sum total of everything learned, but empowering yourself through that resource to, to make the world your own, as they used to say, oyster. What do they say now? <laughs> I think they say pearl. Pearl, pearl. <laughs> I think that there, I tend to look at things in terms of what we have available internally within the individual schools, the School of Drama, the School of Jazz, and the Manus School of Music the larger university, and then externally throughout the city. Because the city is an important ingredient in, I think, the success of any student coming to these schools. Sure. So the first thing I would say is internally, what you have are really strong programs. In some ways, traditionally strong in terms of the rigor, in terms of the skill, in terms of the commitment to artistry. You have both tradition, you have some of the finest faculty anywhere in the world both in terms of major lessons, in terms of performance, in terms of scholarship, um, and a whole range of other areas. You have great facilities, brand new facilities for most of the schools, not all of them, but most of them. You have the university surrounding it. And you also then, of course, have a lot of options within this university. It's not only the types of work that you can choose, a lot to choose from in your individual school or the College of Performing Arts, but then what happens is you can look around the university and make other choices in terms of courses that you might take in the humanities, courses you might take in design, in fashion, in social sciences. It's really an exciting university, particularly when you think that half of the university is comprised of Parsons School of Design, the top rated art and design school in the United States and the second rated art and design school in the world with one of the great fashion schools of the world. So that means it's possible for the opera company, uh, the opera program here, to be doing its um, performances and productions in partnership with Parsons, designing the set, designing the costumes, designing the lighting. And we're seeing those kinds of partnerships uh, manifest throughout the three different schools, all sorts of ways in which performers at these schools, performing students, will partner with students in other parts of the university to create really interesting and exciting programs. So that's the kind of idea of internally what we can provide for your success. And then externally thinking about the city, there are very few places like this, no matter what your art form, if you're an actor, if you're a jazz-oriented musician or a pop-oriented musician or a classical-oriented musician, opera singer, orchestrally interested, chamber interested, composer, film composer, producer, the city has everything. Every orchestra comes here. Every chamber group comes here. The jazz community, there are very few like it. The theater community, all kinds of theater. Um, the TV community, film, just about everything you can imagine that you would want to see in terms of museum, performing arts, fine arts, experimental arts, all the different forms that you would want to find. If you want to be exposed, if you want to be around the greatest artists in the world who not only live here, but that come to visit here. This external piece, I think, combined with the internal piece, makes something um, that's very, very hard to beat. Well, I certainly agree. And I would say that um, I'd like to think that the New School is actually a sort of, um, a sort of marriage between those uh, externals and the internals. The, uh, the, the people who walk through the doors uh, in this building, in our building over at Bank Street, uh, the performers, um, artists, writers, musicians, 
uh, are really extraordinary. They're the most famous and most celebrated and, um, and, and properly celebrated uh, people in the city and in the world. It's uh, really an extraordinary privilege to be, uh, to be here. Um, but to go from these lofty ideas to, uh, <laughs> to the more pragmatic, I would say what it takes to succeed is um, you need to be on time, you need to be prepared, you need to be willing, and you need to be here to learn. Um, and those sound, um, you know, very um, boring and pedantic, but um, the excitement and the opportunity uh, that happens here is really created by the students. And, um, and that requires a great amount of um, self-direction, as Martin alluded to earlier. Uh, and it's also, uh, in the performing arts, you are, you are um, tied inexorably to a group of artists. You're sort of, sometimes we say you're sort of artistic co-conspirators, but you are interdependent in a really profound way. So you need to uh, show tremendous respect for your own talent and to honor your own talent by doing the best you can. Uh, you need to show up. Uh, you need to um, get the most that you can out of the few weeks uh, that you're here. Uh, and you need to be willing to uh, go to places that are not comfortable. Um, our, part of our job is to challenge you, to challenge your notions, to challenge your artistry, to challenge your philosophies, um, and to challenge you at a sort of emotional level to um, to find uh, some equilibrium in, um, in areas with uh, which you might not be so familiar or might have some fear or some anxiety about. Um, uh, we have uh, a tremendous faculty, as Richard says, and um, every, we've, we've been there well, where you've been. Um, but it's only through that kind of working out of the artistic muscles that you are going to be able to achieve, uh, I think, the kind of ambitions that I'm sure you are either uh, secretly or not so secretly harboring. What we see of our job uh, is to sort of build a bridge between your artistic aspirations and your ability to execute. Uh, and that bridge is, um, it takes a while to construct. There's, uh, you know, there's parts that are easy and uh, there are parts that are, that are not so pleasant, uh, but, uh, but very much worth it if you want to, if you have your, your heart set and your mind set and your artistry set on, uh, on, on achieving. So I'm going to take some questions here and, and pose them to you. We have some of our audience online uh, asking some questions. The first is from Sujin Bake, who is a uh, admitted student for the graduate program. She's asking what it's like to be a typical Manus grad student. What is a typical day like? So I wonder <laughs> if you have some <laughs> answers on that. Typical in new school don't really you're, go you're in next the same. <laughs> <so easily>. <laughs> <laughs> the typical day. Well, it. The graduate program certainly has more flexibility, and it also depends on which graduate program. Um, a lot more requirements at the undergraduate level. Um, and the graduate program, again, it depends whether it's the Master of Music or whether it's the Professional Studies program. They're both very, very diff different. The Professional Studies program has tremendous amount of flexibility and a lot of space and time in it where many of the students are spending a lot of time really working on more professionally oriented work in terms of the types of recitals. Many of them are performing with professional organizations. And some people come to the PSD program with advanced degrees from other places. Very often they have masters. Sometimes they have doctorates and come into the PSD program. The Master of Music program, of course, has much more coursework. Um, but what you would find is you're really working intensely if you're on the vocal side, you're working intensely on voice, opera, performance. Um, you don't have certainly as much in the theory and ear training as you would have had at the undergraduate level. If you're an instrumental performer, of course, there's also a tremendous amount of performing, both in chamber works, um, for orchestra. In piano, we have a recital series, a Manus Festival that takes place all across the year in multiple venues. So there's all kinds of performances for pianists. And basically, you have people working on uh, all sorts of other coursework. It could be graduate students who are working on graduate courses in music entrepreneurship. And also, you find people dipping their toes into things. What you'll see, you might see an oboe player at the graduate level decide to take film scoring 
because they're interested in seeing maybe this is something they might be interested in doing. Maybe that graduate uh, violinist has always thought they might like to try improvisation, so they might join an improvisation ensemble, or they might simply look to produce or create or form with their colleagues the very best string quartet they could possibly put together. And those kinds of things are many of the things that comprise um, graduate studies here at Manus. Just follow up to that question, Frank asks, um, how connected is the Manus um, graduate program with internships in New York City? How, many of, how, how much is that available to? It's a growing area, and also the university is providing more support for internships um, than ever before. We also have um, something that's going to really bump up the internship opportunity, and we have a new degree that we're starting next year on an internal launch, and it's actually a Master of Arts Management and Entrepreneurship. And not only will that bring new courses um, that will be available for all graduate students as well as the students in that program, but it's also going to up the game in terms of internships and connections to organizations all throughout the city. And interestingly, we're looking at the program as a way of creating internships where Manus, jazz, or drama students in that program would be serving in internships within the university. So it might be that a jazz student is working in an internship um, in the fundraising department, or in the production department, or in the marketing and communications department. So we're taking a look at the ways in which the university can be opened up even more for internships for those students who would like to um, find these opportunities both internally and, again, externally um, with our partners in the community. Great. And um, Hannah wants to know what a typical day is like as a drama <laughs> BFA student. So the BFA? Yeah. Uh, first year BFA? Well, again, it's hard to say. It's hard to, um, it's, we, we tend not to talk about typical days. But we, we will talk about a week, um, and, um, which is a little bit easier. Because across a week, uh, you're going to have your foundational classes. The first semester, you'll have foundational acting class. Uh, and it'll be in one of the ensembles. Uh, you'll be taking a theater history class. Um, an aesthetic inquiry class, which is a really uh, fantastic um, sort of marriage of philosophy, art appreciation, perception, um, and investigating the relationship between artists and audience. Uh, you'll be taking portfolio, which is um, uh, an eight semester sequence, uh, which is a space for you to reflect on your, um, on your learning, on how you learn, to um, eventually begin to curate your experiences uh, in a way which will allow you, um, after four years, to, uh, to uh, make your way into the, uh, into the professional world or into a master's degree. Uh, and then whatever electives you take. Um, uh, in terms of geography of our campus, most of your classes will be over here uh, in Arnold Hall, where we are now, 55 uh, West 13th Street. Some of them may be over at Bank Street, which is where a lot of our graduate uh, classes are uh, in the far west village. Um, and others in the University Center and at other buildings uh, uh, sort of around this immediate area. Uh, you'll be working uh, with your fellow students in your ensemble and the other 54 students quite a bit. And um, at some point in the semester, you'll probably be auditioning for a main stage play. You might be doing a new play festival. You'll be um, rehearsing for possibly for Creative Cafe, uh, for your scene study classes. Uh, it's a lot, a lot of time uh, on campus. It's a very rigorous program. Um, but it's, and it's also one that uh, requires you to, um, to really be present uh, for, um, for a lot of your time here, to be present and learning and engaged with your, uh, with your peers. Cool. And I have one more question, and then we'll get to some more questions about the program. But um, we have one drama MFA admitted mm -hmm. students who's interested in taking singing classes and wondering if that's even possible. Okay. Which, who is it? Her name is Catherine. Oh, Catherine. Yeah. Well, there, we actually have two Catherines <laughs> coming in. So it's either, well, 
Yeah. Uh, either mm -hmm. one. So singing is actually a, um, uh, in the second year of vocal production, uh, singing is um, a, a year-long uh, inquiry and work and practice. Um, Dr. Chris Roselli is our second year of vocal production teacher, voice teacher, is extraordinarily uh, well-trained. He actually teaches uh, at Manus as well, fantastic teacher. Uh, so that is the primary place where singing uh, is um, applied, is learned as a technique. Um, there is also um, courses and there will be, I guess it's, I guess we can talk now a little bit about musical theater and um, the ways in which we now having come together are pursuing what we call music and theater um, because it really goes beyond musical theater to the area that uh, sits um, uh, in between and among um, um, music and theater. So we did a uh, uh, Kurt Weill, Brecht, uh, Bertolt Brecht uh, musical last fall. We'll be doing another musical this year. Um, the Robert Ashley Opera, if you can call it that, um, he some shied from calling them operas, um, has, um, there are some um, drama students participating in that. Um, so there is, a, there is an area of performance which um, involves music, significantly involves music, and significantly involves uh, theater, uh, and which we think is really uh, the future of a lot of performing arts. And we are actively pursuing that and setting our students up to be, um, to be the people who really lead on that. Uh, music and singing training is fundamental to that. Um, additionally, I think that we are going to be increasing all kinds of opportunities uh, on the singing side of things in the next few years. Cool. So I'm going to ask some, some lofty questions now. Um, I wonder if you could speak, each of you, about what you feel are the key components of being a professional, uh, successful professional performing artist now. Um, as they, as students are coming into this school and then also graduating. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I might pick up the thread of what I was saying before um, about um, you know the ability to know yourself and to engage with the world around you, um, because I think we all would agree that we're in a very hybridized landscape of, uh, of what a successful career means. Mm -hmm. There are less linear paths to a single uh, goal than there ever have been in, in our various art forms. So we, we always talk about the portfolio career. And uh, you know, in order to be successful at the portfolio career, you have to be, I believe, you have to be really good at two or three of those strands and then reasonably good at about another you know, four or five of them. So time management is also a really important factor in mm -hmm. success because you're constantly shape-shifting and dancing and juggling among multiple kinds of good opportunities for uh, a successful life as an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I think um, you know, taking a little bit of the uh, credit again for being in New York City and everything that we do, again, zero degrees of separation, you know, all the pathways are there. The successful artist builds those networks from the first moment they arrive here, and the successful artist will continue to leverage and engage in those uh, relationships and those networks uh, when they are successful in their careers. Mm -hmm. Cool. I think there's a, uh, to pick up on that, yeah. is, um, um, if I may. You know, it's, um, that is all true, and, uh, yes, and, as we say in improv world. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, the, there is a critical mass of um, high-level artists and artistry at the New School, which I think is really unparalleled. Um, and I'm not really given to exaggeration, but it is really extraordinary. And part of, um, part of the value of the New School, I think, is that it's not only making the connections and sort of networking your, your way into a career, which is important, uh, as opportunistic as that may seem, um, but that you are you are actually gathering a tremendous uh, support net network and community of um, like-minded artists while you're here. So when you step out of this, you know, out of uh, beyond our campus, um, which is just a random assortment of buildings in the West <laughs> Village, um, but when you step out of that sort of realm into the profession, you are not, it is not, um, it's not jumping, um, you know, diving into a shallow pool blindfolded, you are really moving out with a whole group of people uh, with whom you've collaborated. You share a common vocabulary. You know what um, your artistic um, sort of complements are. 
um, with each other. Uh, and it is a huge advantage. And we see that all the time with the kinds of um, groups that are formed, theater companies, opera companies, um, these sort of endeavors that are uh, very community-based, very ensemble-based, um, very collaborative. And it's, um, it's sort of a natural progression uh, once you leave here. It's part of your training here, and it's, um, it's, it's um, a tremendous um, opportunity and a really a tremendous value, as I say, to, uh, to being here with this, with this group. I think that, um, I think that as it's always been, you have to be able to, you have to be good at your craft um, at a minimum. You really want to be great. You have to have the goods. You have to have the skills. You have to be able to perform, read, sing. You have to have the knowledge of the craft. I do think those things are sort of fundamental. But I do think more and more people are looking for artists who have something to say, who have a point of view, who have a sort of who are looking at the world and asking questions about where, what their art is, what the relationship of their work has to do with the world. And um, I think that that's, it's interesting that sometimes there are people who may have better technical skill, but maybe they don't have as much to say as artists. And they might have a harder time than the people who aren't quite as good, funny enough, but who have something to say, who are looking at the world around them and asking themselves the question, what will I do? Where will I perform? Who will I play with? What kinds of work do I want to do? How will I support my work? Um, who are the audiences? And it's, it is interesting to me because I think there are some things that seem to have changed um, in the last decade or so. And that's the diversity of places in which people perform and the diversity of people that they perform with. So you might see actors who are going in to work with prison populations, working with incarcerated youth. You might see jazz artists who are doing work and have created organizations to provide artistic services, performance, and other kinds of education for K through 12 audiences, for young kids. And not just teaching an instrument to a kid, but actually teaching them something larger, being an artist in residence. You see all sorts of things happening. You see artists creating their own opera companies. You see artists creating their own collectives. You see artists working in communities in ways they never have before. And basically, you're at a moment where people, I really do think the younger generation is looking at that world. They're looking at other artists. They're asking themselves, what might I do in a different place? Not just, can, is there going to be an opportunity for me to play that Beethoven sonata on a main stage in a recital? And can I make a career doing that? But rather, what are all the places where I might perform? And how can I put together a career different from my teachers, a career that I need to put together and that I need to figure out how to put together? And I think that that is a real difference today. And we're, um, we're deeply dedicated to providing support in order for our students to figure that out. Yeah, and I think that it's, it's interesting because when you look at what's happened in the professional landscape across all the performing arts, not only the performing arts, of course, business, there's a whole, you know, yeah, there's yeah, yeah. You know, many, yeah. many sectors that have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, have had uh, tremendous disruption because of technology and all sorts of things. But certainly the pathways that we grew up with um, towards the profession are really not there. They have been just blown up. Um, and this has caused some anxiety for people of a certain generation. But for young people coming up, it is, an, it is an, a spectacularly um, fascinating and I think exciting moment. Um, there is the question of how you, one is going to support oneself, how one is going to repay yeah. your uh, student loans, pay the rent. The, and those are definitely critical, um, significant questions. But as, as these kind of um, forms and templates have um, vanished quite rapidly, there is a need to replace them with something. And our students, I'd like to think, are the ones who are going to be inventing these forms, who are going to be figuring this out. Um, and uh, it's really, um, it's, it's um, a, a kind of privilege to be in our position at this unique moment to be sort of assisting and facilitating um, this transformation of a, of a generation and of, a, and of an, entire, um, an entire industry. 
I, I do want to add one other thing. I don't mean to um, jump on Martin, but he'll jump in. I, I'm, not, I'm sure of that. I think another thing that's interesting about the university is that more and more, and the support that we want to provide for our students, is that more and more um, with opening up of minors and also the ways in which we're partnering with the other schools, what we're starting to see now, we're seeing graphic design students who want to come to Manus as piano minors. We're seeing violin majors or piano majors who want to come in and do a data visualization minor or a graphic design minor or an architecture minor. And that um, we also see for the students that want really strong technology chops to develop media skills that we are opening up doorways for them to be able to take that work, to be able to learn how to do it and how to blend it into their own practice so that they can not only play the trumpet uh, extremely well, but they know how to work technology, they know how to use technology, they know how to, know how to improvise, sound they know, how to, yeah, for, they know how to do a soundboard, <laughs> uh, they know how to do a whole bunch of things. In fact, we have a student right now in the control room uh, who's basically doing that. But um, that's, that's one of the things that, um, the, it, one of the things I think is really important is that the options that we're providing, while still having a commitment to the skills, to the rigor, um, to be able to play, but to have options and the belief that we have that you as a student are entitled to those options, I think is something that um, is making us a very, very interesting school. You can't, you can't do that at all. I agree. You know, I think yeah, it's, it, it's interesting a, to think about. It's kind of a, what happens here is, is in this new generation, it's kind of a crowdsourcing element, you know, because they, you know, we, we, we provide so much of the, uh, of the underpinning of that, but ultimately it's you out there who take that to where you need to take it, you know, in your, in your relationships, in your collaboration, and it's really kind of unlimited, and it's very exciting where we find ourselves with that opportunity um, to, uh, to just take it where what is right for, the, for them. Yeah, and it is, you know, we talk about this a lot, is that, you know, um, for much of, the, much of the student and the faculty population community here, New School really is a place of making. Um, and it's really the, um, and that's sort of where our hearts are, and that's where, what our hands do, and that's what our minds do. Uh, we think critically about things. We, we are involved in deep practice. We will never not be involved in that. But as uh, more and more people uh, come into our community, whether it's from Parsons, whether it's from New School for Social Research, um, from um, all the other schools, Milano, um, Lang, uh, you know, the making has gotten more and more interesting and more fascinating and less and less predictable. Uh, and I think that is uh, that really is a kind of model for students going out into the out into the world. Yeah. We just have a couple more questions, and then we're going to get going with our wonderful concert tonight. Um, Mitch um, asks a little bit more about what kinds of resources and support do we have for students who want to create projects outside of the school environment or outside of the curricular environment. And I know we Are have a multitude. No, I, oh. I know we have a multitude. Um, but he is a, a, an admitted student in the drama BFA oh. program. Okay. So I guess I was subconsciously looking at it. Well, there's a little, you know, making, I, well, I'll answer from our standpoint. We, uh, we're a little bit different in that we do not, we allow students to actually work professionally um, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the industry, in the world, in theater, film. Uh, music. We had a student whose band got signed to a label and took a year off. We have students who have um, managed to do um, off-Broadway plays and stay in school. We've also had students who have gotten gigs and they've had to uh, take a leave of absence. Mm -hmm. So we are um, somewhat we are flexible about that. We are um, certainly understanding, and um, a lot of our students have been working before they yeah. come here. So we don't um, need them. On the, this is on the BFA side. The MFA is very different, mm -hmm. uh, but on the BFA side, um, and I would say, uh, you know, school is very involved. It's very busy. There's not a lot of free time. So I would a little bit reframe that uh, question and um, really look at the opportunities to make and be involved in projects um, that, um, that you propose and that you initiate and that are your uh, sort of passion projects within the new school. And we have a program called Creative Cafe. Uh, it's very popular, very uh, successful, mm -hmm. uh, in which students um, 
the undergrad students propose projects, often with other students, and um, they go through a series of um, uh, sort of proposal milestones or checklists, which is some of our entrepreneurial work that we do with them. We help them with that, uh, budgeting and space and time. Um, and then um, if it's all approved, they uh, go ahead and we help them find a venue, a space somewhere here at the university, and they produce, they self-produce uh, these projects, and they are fantastic, as I said, very popular. I think we did, I don't know, eight or 12 of them this semester. Um, and our dream is to, um, uh, in the next year or so, bring Manus and Jazz into that so that we're all involved in Creative Cafe. Really, Manus and Jazz are doing that also on their own. It's just not called Creative Cafe. So we're all involved in this kind of mm -hmm. uh, the support of uh, students really pursuing their own work. Right. As long as it's not to the detriment of their right. classes. <laughs> so yeah. have to show up on time and Showing go to school. Doing your work, yeah. But there's room. There is room. There's room for that, and there's support for that as well. So yeah. we have a number of questions, which I will um, let. You, I will get back to the students online um, from Adam and uh, a couple of the other students. Um, Ali, we didn't get to your question about the portfolio, but I can answer your questions um, after we end this session. We are not ending the session, we are starting a beautiful concert with the percussion ensemble in about five minutes. Um, Jim Baker, who is the head of the percussion ensemble, will talk a little bit briefly about the collaboration that uh, was uh, happening in order to produce this concert and also a little bit about the pieces. So those of you who didn't get your questions answered, um, and actually we have um, Jim Baker here now who's going <laughs> to talk to you a little bit about, about the concert and what to um, stay tuned to. So um, he's going to talk a little bit about it right now. Jim, you can come over and we're just finishing. Oh, <laughs> it's fine. There, there are some people online, so you can talk to the. Uh... Great. Hello, everyone. And this is on this thing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm James Baker. I'm the director of the percussion ensemble here at the Manus College. And um, just to give you a little introduction for what we will be playing in a few minutes, um, we will start with a piece by uh, Gerard Griset. And that piece is uh, entitled Steely. It was written in 1995. Uh, Griset was one of the great uh, French composers of the 20th century. He died way too young uh, at the age of 52 or 53. And uh, Steely from 1995 was one that was written in the, in the last uh, three years of his life. And um, <clears throat> at that point, he had really gone from experimenting with, uh, or basically he was the inventor of what's called spectralism. And he'd gone beyond spectralism and, and, it, and it kind of disavowed the term and had gone into much further explorations of sound and density of sound and uh, paucity of sound. And this piece is an exploration. It's just two bass drums and it uses a, a, a variety of ex extended techniques on the drums to get an incredible amount of sound and uh, emotion from these two things. Uh, the next piece uh, is called uh, Hidden and it's by a composer, Anna Thorvald's daughter. And she is an Icelandic composer. She was born in 1977. Uh, she studied here in the United States at the, at the University of California at San Diego. And she's now um, becoming quite a big deal. She was the 2015 winner of the uh, Kravis Emerging Composer Prize of the New York Philharmonic, which is quite a big deal. Uh, she's uh, commissioned by the orchestra to write a piece for them and was given uh, quite a large uh, financial award for that uh, for winning that prize. And this, this piece, Hidden, is uh, for uh, percussionists inside the piano. All they do is play, they never play on the keys of the piano, they play all around the inside of the piano using all different kinds of mallets, techniques, and uh, it's a, an extremely ethereal, very meditative piece. Uh, it's, uh, I think this whole concert is actually just sort of a, an exploration of, um, of, the, of the sonic possibilities of percussion not so much on the loud side, but on the softer side. Uh, most of the pieces are, tonight are, are pretty delicate and um, composed in such a way that they bring out sort of the multiplicity of sounds that are available uh, from the variety of percussion instruments. <clears throat> um, after intermission, we'll have a piece uh, by Lou Harrison called In Praise of Johnny Appleseed. Uh, we've been doing sort of a survey of Lou's music for percussion here in the department for the last number of years, trying to play through all the pieces. Um, <clears throat> you know, Lou Harrison was very important uh, in, in the, in the uh, genre of percussion ensemble. Basically, he was one of the inventors of the genre, along with uh, Henry Cowell and John Cage. 
And uh, this piece is a very early piece, 1942. Um, it's very simple in a lot of ways, but it's also, like most of Lou uh, Harrison's music, it's utterly charming. Uh, the music, the piece is played by instruments that are, one could almost consider primitive, but there's a lot of complexity in their primitivism. Uh, there's a, a, a very like simple wooden flute and so a very simple wooden xylophone type instrument and then just some drums and metal objects, but they're all used to incredibly beautiful effect. The piece was originally written uh, to be danced and we're using dancers tonight. A couple of uh, seniors from the Lang Dance Department, um, uh, Seta Morton, and Tony Carlson will be joining us. Uh, they've done a beautiful job uh, on a uh, uh, sort of, um, they have a different kind of approach to how their music, how they're, how they're dancing this piece. It's not quite so literal. Uh, it's much more of a process-oriented um, approach to the choreography, and it's, it's very beautiful. And the last piece on the program is um, a piece by Toru Takamitsu. Rain Tree from 1981. It's like a classic of the genre, percussion ensemble, <clears throat> just written for mallet instruments. And um, it's an incredibly beautiful, very ethereal, almost, um, uh, it sounds like Olivier Messiaen in a lot of ways. Uh, it very, I think it's very influenced by Messiaen. And um, it's a, a very important piece in the genre. So I hope you enjoy the concert. And I uh, hope that I've been helpful in explaining some of these things to you. And we will now, I need to go and set up and uh, get started. So thank you, thank you Georgia. Thank you. thank you all. Thanks. 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 Thank you. And uh, this will also be playing uh, live stream, but we'll also have this recorded on our website. So if you want to come back and view this. Thank you so much. <laughs> 